Thank you. Uh, first, I mean, thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me here. It's a real pleasure and an honor to be here. And I know I've already found all the talks so stimulating myself. So on a selfish level, I'm glad I got to come and learn so much about all these different perspectives on this 500th anniversary that we're celebrating right now. Um, so this is my first time using a tablet to speak instead of paper, so I'm a little terrified about that, but so far so good. It seems to have enough battery. Uh, with all this talk of where the devil lies in the world, I'm reminded of uh, an old professor of mine who used to say, the devil is still here and the devil lives in these machines. So I'm going to say I hope that the devil does not haunt mine today. Um, so I want to start by, you know, I'm the second to last speaker of the day. I want to start by recapping a couple of themes, partly because I was just delighted to see so many themes uh, that I felt atta attached to my paper in certain ways. So one of those is that we've had a lot of talk about scripture and what scripture means, the role that scripture played um, in sort of assuming a position of authority during the time of the Protestant reforms. and what that does to readers. So what having a book and a text in front of you does to your sense of yourself and your mind, does to your sense of community and the kinds of communities that form around scriptures. And the second theme um, has to do with the fragmentation that surrounded the Reformation movements that we've heard from several speakers and the sense in which and this is connected, of course, to scripture, right? The sense in which when you read scripture, when every person feels some responsibility to interpret for his or herself, you inevitably get fragmentation. And out of this comes a kind of consolidation or attempts at various kinds of consolidation, consolidation of, of states, consolidation of denominations, and uh, perhaps most interesting to me is consolidation of the category of religion itself, that religion at this time becomes as Brad Gregory spoke earlier, um, a kind of thing that's separate from the other things. So we get this unified category of religion. And that's really what I'm after in a lot of my work, is looking at how those unified concepts emerged out of the apparent fragmentation of this time and what they've done to us <laughs> and our identities and how we think about things. So, so that's just a little preface to, to hopefully give you, you know, a recap of the day, at least from my perspective, and, and a way into what I think my paper is getting at, even though I had no idea really what other people were talking about. So with that said, um, I have been asked, my assignment was to speak on liberal trajectories of Reformation theology. And initially, I have to say this made me smile for a lot of reasons, um, in part because liberal is not a label that I've ever sought or claimed in my work. But I get it. I work at Harvard Divinity School. <laughs> I belong to a mainline Presbyterian church. And if you know anything about my alma mater, New College of Florida, you know that it is many things and conservative is not one of them. Most of the students there, like Democrats, were the conservatives <laughs> at my undergrad. Um, and if I'm being honest, you know, this impacted me and my politics have mostly swung progressive for a long time. So the request makes enough sense. But at the same time, if I'm you know, continuing to be biographical here, um, I would add that my first 20 years of my life were deeply shaped in a milieu in which the term liberal functioned as a serious epithet. Uh, it felt almost like a floating microbe or something like that, that that might pollute otherwise decent persons, schools, churches, parties, books, ideas. Uh, like when, you know, I think like when you've seen the news when like Chipotle or something, you know, poor Chipotle, sorry, but they have like an outbreak of a, you know, uh, E. coli or whatever and then everybody, you know, you know you'll probably be fine if you go there, but you're just a little worried. That's, that I feel like is how liberal functioned. It's like something good might be there, but you really probably don't want to take the risk. <laughs> so as I said, I'm speaking from anecdotal experience here from personal experience, and I don't intend to generalize to other people's experience, but I also expect that I've been around enough communities to know that this is not a mere outlier. And I know full well that the suspicion can go the other way too. In my own mostly progressive church, when somebody new comes, sometimes there'll be whispers that that person comes from a conservative background, and the effect of this is to translate to a kind of tiptoeing around that person for fear of there's some fear, and I haven't actually seen this happen most of the time anyway, but there's a fear that if you're not careful, you'll trigger some sort of landmine response of aggression from a conservative person. So as I said, not endorsing these by any stretch is telling you sort of what I've seen. And of course, I expect that we've all witnessed a similar dynamic on our national stage here in the United States, especially in the last year. 
if you're like me, you've seen innumerable think pieces that try to give some kind of account of why so many Americans don't trust each other anymore and perhaps even hate each other, or how it came to be that we inhabit such radically different media and epistemic bubbles, so different that sometimes we feel like they're fully incommensurate. And some people are even asking questions like whether conservative and liberal brains are wired in the same way. So it's a given, right now at least, that we're divided, which is to say that we have come to know ourselves as divided. And the self-knowledge is reinforced every time we feel a surge of shock or outrage at someone else's politics. Every time we, wit we witness a kind of self-organizing social phenomena that constellates around the use of these two labels as various public personalities who have come to represent either conservatism or liberalism, like a synecdoche in our collective public consciousness. So at the very least, I think something like Foucault's power knowledge seems to be at play. When self-described liberals or self-described conservatives embrace such labels and acquiesce to their effects, allowing them to performatively organize our patterns of thought and life, and to activate networks of relationships that are mediated by either trust or suspicion. So what I'm saying here is there's a label that's kind of floating around, and to the extent that you claim it, which you know might be something that you don't feel like you made an active choice to do, but you sort of let yourself be funneled into this, then there's this performance of who you belong with and who you don't belong with. And this gets to something that I'm going to be chasing after in my remarks today, which is how close attention to some early Reformation approaches to reading, and particularly that of Calvin, might upset this binary dynamic and might give us some resources for not only thinking, but finding ways to live beyond them. So my remarks today are about reading in a capacious sense, which is to say that it not only has to do with like sitting down and reading a book, it does have to do with that, but it also has to do with how inevitably we will relate what we read to the world in which our bodies lives, to the world our bodies inhabit, and to the very sense of who we are in relation to others. So what I'm talking about generally is interpretation, right? Not only how we read, but how we make sense of what we read in time, or how we read the signs of our own times in relation to other signs. So not just relating parts to holes within texts, but also imagining or managing how worldly experience shapes reading and how reading in turn shapes worldly experience. So I find that these questions are shot through the legacy of the Protestant Reformations because, of course, as we've been saying all day, one major strategy of those movements involved placing the divine word at the front and center of a Christian's religious life and practice, granting scripture the highest authority over life and proceeding to orient both individual life and community life around what is entailed in reading, listening, and together interpreting a text correctly. So specifically today, I'll be exploring what I take to be Calvin's often overlooked debt to a tradition of signification coming from Augustine and how it came to shape Calvin's thinking on the relationship between scripture, theology, and reform. So what it means to actively engage and become a sort of activist in the world to take, um, to take an effort at reforming an institution. Along the way, I hope to refer back to, this, to the more familiar impasses we've seen between theological liberals and theological conservatives and give an account, if not of something like a common ancestor, at least a common set of questions to which both sides have been traditionally and practically accountable. So that's where I'm headed. I'm heading to the matter of reading and textual authority, to Augustine's theory of signs, and to Calvin's 16th century appropriation of Augustine's theory, and ultimately to the question of the practices through which signs, and by signs I really just mean words. Um, I mean that something, I don't just mean words, but you can think about that, you know, that, that sounds like a weird word you don't usually hear people say. I find that I say the word signs all the time, and I'm like rare among people in that sense. But what I mean is something that points to something else. And often it's words, sometimes it's things. So I'll say more about that. But what I'm interested in is the question of the practices through which signs are given to aid believers in being more fully responsible 
to material things and existing things around them. But first, let me step back and give a little bit of a fuller introduction to what I take to be the philosophical issues that are at stake in our familiar and, I think, destructive binary between liberals and conservatives. So if you follow a certain train of thought about the use and effects of language itself, one that you could call Derridian, uh, but with a few alterations I think you could also call Augustinian, then you might argue that the dynamic of labeling things both in relation to and against other things is a fundamental feature of how language works. Marking differences is how language helps us to organize our world and conceive of our place in it and in relation to all the other things and people around us. We make sense of the things around us by giving names to things. And those names perform the effect of relating that thing to something else. So for example, to call something a tree both relates it to other things we also call tree and defers the possibility of it being a bush or a flower or a telephone pole. So for Augustine, all signs are things, and all things are also signs existing in play with one another, except, of course, in the case of God. God is a fully self-referential thing who does not point beyond to something else, but who rather creatively and redemptively secures the chain of relationships between other signs and things. So once again, all things, all signs are things. So words are things, just like the chairs we're sitting on are things. All things are also signs. They point to other things except for God. In the thinking of Bonaventure, for example, who would come to reoccupy this tradition of thinking about signification about 750 years after Augustine, the only truly literal speech would be speech God addresses to himself. But in the realm of conventional use, that is, in the realm of ordinary, everyday human use, the realm of analogy and metaphor, if you follow this tradition of thinking about language, the dynamic is always and inevitably more fraught. This is where Augustine and someone like Derrida will nod to one another across time and across perhaps expectation, because they agree, more or less, that the signs that comprise language mean, they enact meaning by pointing to things, and in some sense, when they do that, they fabricate the identity of the thing to which they point. So they actually create a kind of object that can then be used in a certain way. And this is inevitably an imperfect process. Augustine and Derrida both think so for different reasons. It's imperfect because conventional signs can never fully capture the thing to which they refer. When they create that identity, they always leave something out. When they reveal something, they also hide something away and they shield it from our mental and physical view. And of course, this becomes all the more powerful when we're talking about the, the peculiar kinds of signs that we use to create and reinforce a binary opposition, like between liberals and conservatives. A pair of names that are used to do two things simultaneously, both to give a comprehensive account of the thing to which they refer, and to strictly exclude something else to which they're opposed. So even if I weren't already talking about this liberal conservative binary, it would present an excellent case in point for talking about this dynamic. It's got to be one of the most powerful players in the contemporary power game of binaries. We've all seen how it slips and slides from the domain of the religious to the social, to the political, to the economic, and back to the religious, dividing and conquering, clarifying, but only through obfuscation. If you're like me, you're familiar with the dangers of this effect. You know full well that a lot of details are being left out when these identities get created and claimed. And you know that you should give up using them and you should stop participating. But that also means ignoring something that's become real and therefore must be dealt with as a reality, albeit one that need not be immutable. So that's why I put scare quotes around the word liberalism in my title today, even though I gave myself some side eye while doing it. Because academics, as we know, love to quote and hyphenate and asterisk and parenthesize, which feels like paying an indulgence before we sin. <laughs> we know all too well that these terms are unwieldy and that they obscure, sometimes more than they clarify, but in the end, we keep on using them. Maybe because sometimes it feels like the last vestige of what ties together our fragmented discourses and makes us intelligible to one another. 
But this goes back to this dynamic that several speakers have been talking about, right? The way that we create a category like religion in order to try to solve a problem of fragmentation, and the category itself ends up creating more and more fragmentation. So is there a way to gain some purchase, some perspective on the questions, or the implicit, even subconscious decisions that might lie behind this binary and usher one toward identifying with one side rather than the other? So like, what's going on when you're reading and you find yourself sort of siding with one side on this sort of political social landscape? So I want to explore how reform, and specifically the problem of how to theologically think about something like church reform. So here, I mean, I don't think that I'm opposed to the historical, but I'm really thinking in terms of the theoretical. I'm thinking, what would it mean, given the sort of situation you had in the 16th century, to rethink something like reform of the church, and the church in particular, right? So I'm interested in how this intellectual problem helped to elevate the practice of reading, both as an intellectual and a practical concern, and I take this to, at the very least, refer to the central concern of someone like John Calvin himself. On a sheer intellectual level, to reform the church meant rethinking the authority by and through which the church itself could be reformed. And this meant elevating the use, I mean, for a lot of people, the option, right, was to elevate the use of a revealed text and the practices surrounding the uses of such a text as a critical tool for reform and rethinking life around reform. And this in turn meant embarking on a sophisticated account of precisely how the revealed signs of scripture can be made responsible to the world in what was taken to be a more true and accurate way. A process that finally enabled a logic of responsibility to which the church itself could then be made accountable. So you gotta carve out a kind of space outside the church if you're gonna reform the church. And it's this use of scripture that creates that space, theoretically, for you to be able to do that. So I think that looking at some of the ways that reading is tied to deliberate embodied practices of attention in Calvin's writing will offer some critical perspective on the, on the particular interpretive decisions that play a key role today, for example, in whether and why one identifies as a theological conservative or a theological liberal. I'm in search of something like the interpretive hinge point that funnels a reader in one direction or the other. And if we can get a clearer sense on what the hinge point is in one key text, so I'm only looking at one author in one text, you know, in some context, but that's where I'm focusing. Um, maybe in that one text and all of its complications, we can see where some of those decisions come from and gain some perspective on the realities that are deferred by the binary that haunts us. Since at least the early 19th century, Protestant liberalism has come to connote a kind of fidelity to what is deemed the realistic and scientifically established conditions of imminent life or ordinary life. Which, for example, has led some interpreters to downplay literal readings of miracles and to make efforts to accommodate Christianity to the perceived demands of modern epistemic and social life rather than working to submit modern life to Christianity or Christian teaching. This, at any rate, is the pejorative description of liberalism, and there's obviously some truth to it. I'm not entirely contesting it, but that's the, that's the sort of caricature, right? Is the caricature is that liberals will prioritize what science says over what the Bible says, interpret the Bible in light of science or culture. Um, many self-described liberals would probably see themselves in this description, in as much as it emphasizes the accountability of Christian revelation to the reality of the world, so for example, to the findings of science psychology and the intricacies of historical experience as lived out by a variety of identity groups. So following the logic of binaries, Protestant conservatism appears as a kind of photo negative. To be conservative is to perform fidelity to scriptural teaching above all else, to commit oneself to defining present life according to the terms given by scripture. For the last couple of centuries, conservatives will routinely proclaim commitment to the historic Christian faith or to sound biblical principles to brand their identity and describe their posture as one that seeks to either fight or sometimes to transform culture rather than risking acclimating Christianity to the sway of present concerns. So this is the first of my claims. If ideas were DNA, and in a way they are, if we could trace their genealogy as such, I think it would be possible to see in Calvin's writing a kind of common ancestor in both impulses. But with that said, I do want to make a disclaimer 
I want to make clear that I'm not treating Calvin as a single progenitor or patient zero of Protestant theology as a whole. He is certainly not that, and you are all aware, many people have gestured to and taught us about the genuine diversity and heterogeneity of the Protestant traditions. So with that said, there are two main reasons I'm focusing on Calvin. The first is quite simple. He's the guy I work on, so that's who I want to talk about. And my work often proceeds on the conviction that it's worth taking a close look at the texture of one body of writing in order to gain some perspective on the more complicated interplay of ideas that shape our world. I take a text to be, in some ways, the record of a mind. But the very nature and existence of a text makes us face the reality that no one mind can control the reverberations of the signs that are sewn together and translated and reproduced constantly on paper. So this means that texts take on a body of their own with a life of its own. And if we pay close attention to the shape of those textual bodies, we might gain some perspective on our own logical ecosystems. And the second reason is that it's the case that Calvin's theological legacy has yielded the turf for a particularly vicious version of the battle between theological liberals and conservatives. So in some ways, I feel like with all the variety of people in the room, this is a, a little bit of like airing the dirty laundry of Presbyterians. So I'll fully own up to that, and hopefully you'll learn something from it, or at least you can gawk at it. Um, so I think that what we see in Calvin's writing is not only the unintentional bequeathing of a problematic that has often pitted Presbyterian against Presbyterian and other related denominations, but also some helpful resources for clarifying the theological and intellectual hinge point on which that battle turns. So I hold no illusions that Calvin's view and signification will solve or resolve the sedimented misunderstandings and underlying anxieties that divide liberals and conservatives, whether among those who claim his lineage or among those who don't. But what it might do is allow us a kind of tilt of the head concerning the more fundamental question of what is at stake in the binary itself, because it is the question of how a person embedded in time and space claiming allegiance to a revealed text might become one who is able to read the signs of the times. OK, so I've spoken a little bit already about Augustine's theory of signs and signification, how for Augustine, all learning happens through signs, but signs are always imperfect mediations that are nevertheless made useful by grace to reorient the self in relation to God. So I'll say just a little bit more about that so you can see the contrast and the, and the deep debt that Calvin holds to Augustine. So in major works like De Doctrina Christiana and De Magistro, Augustine argues that revealed signs enable a student, and he writes these texts to students, like in his, you know, in the introduction to the text, it's a letter to a student. So this is very much a text on learning that are performing learning and carrying out learning, or teaching anyway. So he writes to, that a student, signs will enable a student to gradually learn and inhabit the proper hierarchy of relationships between material things and the creator. This is made possible not because signs transparently present truth to the mind, but because the operation of signs in the world is made legible and made learnable, in that sense, by analogy to Christ himself. Christ, for Augustine, is the word made flesh, is the mediator who enables one's journey to God both ontologically, so in, in reality, in a sense, in being, and pedagogically, so in learning. Augustine refers to the incarnation as both the goal of Christian teaching and the road to the goal. And this is because the incarnation, because of the incarnation, a student embarking on the Christian life can proceed in faith that words do assume a meaningful relationship to things. We might not always know what it is, and we're not always going to know what it is. You can have faith that you're not just going to get lost in some alternate reality apart from the material world as created. And this means that one's own self can therefore also assume a meaningful relationship both to other things around us and through that, especially to God. So in De Doctrina Christiana in particular, Augustine sets out to provide rules and guidelines that teach a student this posture of interpretation by telling his student that all things are signs and all signs are also things except for the thing that is God. He essentially is placing words and material things on the same playing field. He's arguing that words and things share the same basic semiotic structure, 
or they perform meaning in the same fundamental way. Words point to things, and things also point beyond themselves to other things, and all of these together point to the creator. And if one can learn how to read the signs for which scripture is eminently useful, one can assume a life in relationship to all things such that one's own life points back to God the creator and finds its purpose and its rest in him. Augustine also instructs his students that all things are either to be used or to be enjoyed. And once again, this is not, uh, it's like how God is the one exceptional thing. It's actually like 99.99% of things are to be used and the other 0.1% is to be enjoyed because the thing to be enjoyed is God and, and God alone. God is the only thing that can rightly serve as a thing of enjoyment because God is that thing for which there is no further desire. There is no sign that points beyond God. There's no desire that finds its satiation beyond God. Words, therefore, help to mediate our desires by relating things in a certain pattern to act as their conduit, essentially. They address desire, they carry it, and through training, they help us direct our desire to where it ultimately belongs. So, so far, this has two important implications that Calvin picks up on in his 1559 Institutes of the Christian Religion. First, Augustine and Calvin make very clear that words and things work together in a domain of usefulness. Words and strings of words have this quality of thingness. They operate in one dimension like a tool or like a technology that can be used for a broader, wider purpose. Calvin will repeatedly write that Christian doctrines are adjudicated or understood and, and measured according to their usefulness in and to the life of the believer. This usefulness does not somehow negate their truthfulness. It's not like use and truth are opposed for Calvin. Rather, usefulness completes the sense in which they are fully truthful. Doctrines can only be properly understood when a reader, when a practitioner understands how to use them, and through them to come to enjoy her created and redeemed relationship to God. Second, it follows from this that words cannot be definitively separated from or opposed to the things to and through which they point a soul to God. A student Christian, sorry, a Christian student in training cannot simply read the text and ignore the conditions that have shaped and formed her embodied experience. If revealed words, if the words of scripture perform the task of reorienting the self, they do so by means of illuminating and revealing the qualities of the things around us and as such, they teach us how to direct our desire through those things toward God. To be properly oriented in that chain of signification that flows from God through God's creation, one must not only look to God, one must learn and practice the proper choreography of existing in and attending to the rich expanse of things God has given. To understand the precise way that Calvin follows Augustine on matters of words and signification, there is one more aspect of Augustine's pedagogy that I want to lift up, and that is the two interpretive rules that he offers to his students. So these rules are not doctrines themselves, but they are prerequisites that one must follow in order to have any hope of understanding what the, what the Bible says and what doctrines are taught through the Bible to us. So the first one is the rule of faith that directs you to begin any inquiry in any reading of the Bible first by clinging to the basic tenets of Christianity itself, so particularly the incarnation. So here we have this kind of, the, the incarnation being the anchoring analogy of any kind of learning. If you're gonna proceed on learning, you have to start by having faith that gives you hope that learning was going to get you somewhere. And this, of course, is where that famous kind of Augustinian legacy of faith seeking understanding comes from. But the second rule is the rule of love. And this is where Calvin's thinking as a Protestant reformer, deeply indebted to Augustine, but struggling with very different circumstances, gets pretty interesting. According to Augustine, the ability to interpret requires not just foregrounding the aim of love, but more concretely placing oneself, one's own body, in the material context of the church, where love can be concretely practiced. The church is the material domain in which interpretation is exercised in real time, where one becomes explicitly accountable before the holy command to love other people and to love them not just as abstract concepts, but as beings who face you with all the little details and all the little annoyances that can make loving especially hard on a day-to-day -day basis. 
So to be trained as a reader of scripture means holding all interpretations that you're drawing accountable to the command to love the person who is right in front of you or right next to you or right before you when you're in church. So Calvin's magnum opus, the 1559 Institutes that I've been reading, borrows from Augustine in a number of ways. You're probably well aware, if you know anything about either of them, well, especially about Calvin, you're probably aware that he draws from Augustine on matters of justification and grace and predestination, as do many of the reformers. But once you know what you're looking for, you can see little nods to Augustine's theory of signs and signification all over the place. Whenever Calvin talks about the use and benefit of doctrines, when he claims that the purpose of his theological writing itself is to guide students of sacred theology to, quote, read the divine word and, quote, to direct it to its proper end. And of course, the debt is apparent um, in Calvin's often repeated call to assume the posture of piety. Calvin defines piety as, quote, reverence joined with love of God, which the knowledge of his benefits induces. I'm going to say that one more time because it's kind of a mouthful. Piety is reverence joined with the love of God, which the knowledge of his benefits induces. So like Augustine's rules, piety is not a doctrine in itself. It is this kind of cyclical posture that enables one to read and profit from doctrine and ultimately to relate doctrine to life. It is both a prerequisite and an outcome. Piety is essentially about feeling all the feelings and through feeling all the feelings, embarking on a process of knowledge tied to use and benefit that comes to refine and clarify and direct all the feelings that you feel. Still, Calvin does have one pretty sticky problem when it comes to the rule of love. After all, his career is forged out of his criticisms of what he saw as fundamental church corruption. So he cannot uncritically direct his reader to just go participate in the church. For Calvin and many of his contemporaries, the established church, whether fairly or unfairly, is one of the most dangerous places a pious person can go. In his view, it represents, or it presents one, it challenges one with lures to idolatry at every turn. So how then does Calvin, the Augustinian that he is, give an account of how one should interpret in a fully embodied way? What replaces the church in this thinking about teaching? What replaces the church as the proper site where the call to interpret according to the rule of love can be exercised. For Calvin, the material site of habituation in concrete love is reframed as the world itself. The world, in other words, becomes the proper domain in which you learn to read and relate revealed signs to things, to learn their fuller meanings, and with their help, learn to perceive the fuller dimensions of meaning that structure the self and the world in relationship to God the Creator. There are a number of places where Calvin explicitly nods to this. In the first book of the 1559 Institutes, he addresses his reader and medius res in the middle of things as someone who was created to perceive God's glory in the world, but who suffers from the holistic damage of the fall. For Calvin, the effects of sin skew perception and they make a person vulnerable to feelings of dread, confusion, excessive pride and the general urge to fashion idols as self-given comforts um, that are also short-sighted comforts. But nevertheless, in spite of Calvin's famously, infamously robust view of sin, Calvin also insists on calling the world the theater of God's glory, the very schoolhouse of God's children. And later, when he presents the knowledge of Christ the Redeemer in particular, he argues that the very frame of the universe was to have been the school in which we were to learn piety. In view of the catastrophe in which human beings now find themselves, the incarnation of Christ furnishes the proper kind of accommodation to gradually restore, never perfect, but gradually accommodate and enable the ability to see God's glory once again. Along these lines, when Calvin presents scripture, he famously calls scripture spectacles. And if you unpack the metaphor, scripture is not the thing being read as an end in itself. It is the gracious, physical, useful, tool-like technology through which one can look around and see the glory of God once again in the world, knowing God once again as loving Father, and knowing oneself once again as loved by God. So, both authors agree fundamentally on what Christian teaching is and the role that words play in making a Christian student better able to perceive the things that they are and their respective relationships to each other and to God. 
but where Augustine calls his student to participate in the church, Calvin calls his student to participate in the world. And that participation is what ultimately gives Calvin his Archimedean point from which the church itself can be reformed. If one wants to reform the operation of the church, that reform must be rooted in this fundamental pedagogical posture, one that relates revealed signs to created things. The reform of the world and the reform of the church are therefore placed on the same plane and are rooted in the same basic posture. And by implication, the world itself has something to teach a student about what it really means to love. So this, I think, takes us pretty close to the hinge point that I have been hunting for. The mutual relationship Calvin envisions between revealed signs and the frame of the universe, the theater of God's glory, is the interpretive exercise that does not answer, but rather gives birth to questions that have occupied Calvin's many students over many centuries now, and ultimately funneled them into a kind of liberal or kind of conservative bent with regard to how this interpretive process happens. And if we're going to follow Calvin's thinking on the matter, it's not really sufficient to answer the question in a binary fashion. Because there is no either or choice between the commitment to revealed words on the one hand and the created qualities of material things on the other hand. When you're in the place of a student who is learning, the two have to be in conversation with one another. I'll assume as given that everyone agrees that Calvin prioritizes fidelity to scripture. He's pretty famous for that. But there are also a number of places in the Institutes where Calvin underscores the important real qualities of created things, and more importantly, gives those qualities an active role in interpretation itself. So without taking too much more time, I'll just name a few to give you a sense of what I'm thinking, especially if you know Calvin. So the first one that comes to mind is when Calvin forwards his infamous reading of divine providence. I call it infamous because Calvin famously has this very strong reading of providence where God is willing and causing everything that happens in a certain sense. But he anchors that reading in a posture toward the world that is often overlooked. According to Calvin, God's providence works in three distinct ways. Sometimes it intervenes in worldly affairs, overriding ordinary causes. More often, providence works by bridling worldly events and maintaining in a creative posture the ongoing life of the world itself without letting it sort of devolve into chaos. But the primary way that providence works, according to Calvin, is as an act of affirmation. Providence affirms creation in its inception and continues it by affirming the integrity of natural causes themselves. And Calvin suggests that understanding the doctrine of providence ultimately calls a student to do likewise. The student should assume, assume a posture of affirmation toward an active interest in the world as it exists. So it's not just starting in the domain of creation in order to practice the rule of love, so to speak, or piety, but it's also a certain posture toward that world that is interested in the real existence of its created ca causes. Secondly, and along these same lines, when Calvin discusses the use of scripture, he insists that scripture works by attuning the reader to the fuller dimensions of created existence. Scripture does not compete with other accounts of what created things are like and how they work. Rather, scripture tactically positions them in all of their own created quasi-independent integrity in a full relationship to God and humanity. So what scripture does in large part, what, why we need scripture is not just to understand how something works in its internal causal quality, but to understand what the implications are of the relationships around that between human beings and between all of us and our creator. So for example, rainbows are divine promises, but they are also optical phenomena. Clouds are divine chariots, but they're also accumulations of water vapor. So scriptural spectacles don't redefine the world, they attune the wearer to the glory that inheres at its very edges in and around its complex natural causes. Third and finally, there is Calvin's theory of Eucharistic presence. And it provides what I think might be the most compelling case in point. So you're likely to know, if you know much about the Reformation, I know of some know a whole lot in this room, but for, anyway, Calvin presents a middle way between Martin Luther, who wants to hold the divine presence in the closest possible relation to ordinary things, and Zwingli, who wants to assert the ontological separation between God and the world as a safeguard, he thinks, against idolatries and superstitions. Calvin wants to keep heaven and earth separate, too, which is what provokes him, back to Augustine in part, to rely on this theory of signs to talk about how things are related. 
And now Augustine, I mean, this is a kind of an aside, but Augustine brings this fuller theory of ontology to it that Calvin does not fully adopt. But what Calvin does adopt is the idea that signs perform this mediation of relationships across difference. Um, again, this kind of physical tool-like operation to orient a proper kind of relationship between God and creation. So when Calvin asserts the spiritual presence of Christ in the bread and wine, he does not index that presence to a kind of mental memory that can be conjured by words alone. He indexes the words of institution, the words of the Eucharist, to the natural properties of bread itself. Bread is constituted to provide nourishment to the body. And by knowing this, we also know by analogy what Calvin thinks Christ wants to teach. What Christ wants to teach, according to Calvin in the Eucharist, is how Christ's body nourishes human beings spiritually. It is not just that the Eucharist maintains the natural properties of bread, the natural properties of bread themselves also teach a practitioner about the more subtle realities of the spirit of Christ in the, in the world, in the community. So it's a metaphor in which one becomes uncertain which is the sign and which is the thing. And for the metaphor to do its work, one must not only pay attention to both, it must, attention must also be paid in real time through a series of practices designed to relate the two. All right, back to my conclusion in the bigger picture that I'm trying to get out here. Calvin is a major player in a wider Reformation legacy that is known for making a specific kind of intellectual and practical move. One that privileges the word, particularly scripture, as the central and guiding authority shaping and organizing the terms of the Christian life. I've tried to consider some of the embedded, embodied, temporal and spatial practices that Calvin attaches to that basic claim, the logic of which he borrows from Augustine and others. But Calvin also took the liberty of refashioning it to fit what he saw as the urgent concerns of his time. And the basic posture that comes out of this, what I've been calling the hinge point, involves an approach to the use of words that actually is aggressively opposed to the function of binaries and creating these kind of labels that I talked about at the beginning. Because for Calvin and Augustine before him, words are not given to bestow prefabricated identities, nor to define things to the exclusion of their more fuller dimensions and causal capacities. Words are technologies useful for performing a certain kind of work that relates different kinds of things to one another. Words address us, challenge us, turn us in different directions, and ultimately attune us to dimensions of life that we might otherwise ignore, pass by, or hope to erase. Because Calvin thinks sin is part and parcel of this whole logical ecosystem, embarking on the path of Christian teaching must mean using words to tactically disrupt prefabricated identities. And they can do this because when a word is used in practice, it is always attentive to the details of things and in a sense vulnerable to being redefined and disrupted by the details of those things. So words can perform the act of disrupting what might otherwise seem stable and accepted about who we are. So I certainly harbor no illusions that pinpointing this kind of interpretive hinge point can lead to a kumbaya moment among the right Calvinists and the left Calvinists or whoever identifies remotely in those circles. But what it does do, I think, is pose a question and what might be a kind of bold proposition to some. And that is that the efforts of both of these sides iterate within the same problematic. So for example, Schleiermacher, Bart, James Cone, even someone like J. Gresham Machen, all see the proper Christian teaching and Christian community in general as this exercise of relating scripture and world, words and things. So as the various Reformation movements approach their 500 year mark, and as we find ourselves increasingly funneled in our daily lives into binary identities, often against our will, it may be a good time to take stock of this posture and recognize, for example, that black liberation theology can be as fiercely devoted to scripture as covenant theology. This would at the very least refocus the question and perhaps instead of prefabricating another identity in the hope of ending the fragmentation by embracing in a certain sense the fragmentation of our reading, we can find a common set of questions that we can chew over together. Because the question in a theological context is not whether one is committed to the authority of the word or to worldly conditions, it is rather whether and how one inhabits a practice in which the word and world are made responsible to one another. Thank you.